trade on. And I'm sorry to say that there is actually no secrets to share that will solve all of your concerns. Uh, but there are a few things that we can consider that may help you. So the three R's of volunteer management often come down to recruitment, recognising and retention of volunteers. Uh, it's the most sought after um, work that we have through the training team. Um, but what I'd like to do through this is just pose some ideas to you and some situations that may get you to start to think about how are you doing things um, and what are areas that can be improved on. Um, and we haven't got time in this session to get through it all, but we can certainly get deeper into it if you have some follow up questions that come up for you. So your volunteers come to you um, with a whole range of parts that make their, up who they are. And your recruitment process really starts with you starting to look and identify what is your ultimate volunteer. So how many of you have something or some quality that you see has to, is a not negotiable that your ultimate volunteer must possess? What's something that they have got going for them that makes them part of the package that is the ultimate community legal service volunteer? I'm thinking I can make, so you've got to help me out here. I'll, I'll expect a few answers here of what people think. And some of it is around the skill that they're bringing. So they obviously need to have some sort of professional acumen that suits what you need. And they also need to have a drive uh, and a personal quality that will allow them to um, meet the obligations that you expect of them. This is really where your recruitment starts and you might sit there and go, what is your ultimate volunteer? But when you look at that, are you looking at who is your volunteer now? Because you've got some things that will match very well and you'll get some things that aren't going to be a good match. But are you looking at it as the world now or do you need to stop and consider where your organisation and the community you are within and the work environment is moving towards? So who in your... Uh, cool. So who in your volunteer, ultimate volunteer package, are they the type of volunteer that is going to suit in five and ten years? Are you going to have recruitment strategies that are going to meet the changing demands of who the people are that you're servicing, what your community is looking like, and also who the people are that you're trying to get as volunteers? Because you may find you need to move away um, from your traditional volunteer that comes in at set times um, to a more episodic project-based volunteer experience for them because that's the way that our, the people are moving towards. So then we start to look at um, the other big thing about when you're recruiting a volunteer and that is why are they volunteering? So we've, we can see how they've volunteered and the different ways people volunteer, but we have to also look at their motivations. So this snapshot was taken on um, overall volunteers. I guess yours would be skewed a little in that the ones that are learning new skills or um, are contributing their skills and experience would be a little bit uh, higher than the, the broad average. So the concept of what motivates a person to volunteer is really quite complex. Um, some have tried to define it down to neat little descriptors, but there's never been one that really fits at all. So as you would experience, you have a lot of volunteers in your service and a lot of them can be actually doing the same task as another volunteer, but you may find that their motivations for being there are completely different. Get past the skill part of it or, or what they have to do as the hours for their, their credits what actually motivates them to come and what motivates them to choose your service against another service. So you need to consider when you're managing a volunteer program that 
what are their motivations and what are the goals that they want to get out of out of the experience because you need to match those so it kind of means that you need an experience an individual experience for every one of your volunteers although of course you can clump them a little bit I'm just seeing here that um, that some are trialling that remote volunteering for the flexibility and I can imagine uh, and I know I spoke with Carly that even in small or small communities it would become a little bit more difficult for you to get volunteers um, because they've got a conflict of interest by their paid work but also perhaps the the, the beauty of choice that's out there um, which we'll talk about a little later so what you need to do um, right from your recruitment is start to look at what is motivating that volunteer to choose to come and help you out. This should be a question at recruitment. It should be what motivates you, what do you want to get out of this and it shouldn't just be filed away in an HR file. That then bleeds into your recognition processes for that volunteer which we'll go to. But I wanted to show you another concept around recruiting of volunteers. And I want you to think about recruitment of volunteers in a courting analogy. You're building a relationship with somebody. So you don't know this person or you may know of them, but you really don't know them. So if you're in this situation in a personal level, you would have a first date, a second date, and you'd be hoping for some future dates. You don't go in on the first date and ask them to marry you. And yet we kind of treat volunteers like that. They turn up at the door, we give them a bunch of paper, they sign their life away and they're ours. Let's take it back a bit and say, what about the first date if we just ask them about themselves? Now, what do you do on a first date? You tend to show off your good bits. You tend to tell people all the good things and they tell you how great they are and it's perfect and wonderful. On a second date, you might choose to go beyond the safety of a coffee shop or and go to a movie or go for a walk along the beach or something like that and show your personality a little bit more, but you experience each other. What do you do to allow a volunteer to experience your organisation without actually committing to it? Is there a chance that they can be part of it without buying into it? Um, lock, stock and barrel. So then you start to kind of get that second date and this is also where you need to start considering are they a good fit? Are they the volunteer that's going to work in your organisation? And if that's not the case then you say oh, it's not you, it's me and all those lovely ways of getting yourself out of it. But it also makes sure it's very open and honest and allow them the chance to do exactly the same. But of course you're always aiming that it's all going to be great and there are future dates and that they do become a volunteer that's and it's mutually rewarding for both of you. So once you've gone through a bit of a dating scenario and it can be sped up quite quickly um, if it needs to be but there should be an opportunity for them to opt out and for you to opt out as well. Is there anyone that actually does have a process where they get to try before they buy as a volunteer with your organisation? It is kind of a um, an interesting one of, well, how do we have the time to do that? How do we do that? What would we do? Think about it that you could always use other the volunteers in that process. So do you allow other volunteers to recruit new volunteers for you or to get involved with the volunteer recruitment process? So it's just something to think about of how do you make sure that the, everyone's happy before you start. I'm going to just slip through these ones which is about recruitment processes and places you can go but I can certainly um, answer those questions if people need some hints. I want to move on to how you recognise and reward your volunteers. So as I mentioned, part of um, recruitment is finding out what's motivating them to be there and that bleeds into also the recognition and rewarding of volunteers. So. The very first thing that is in their mind when they come along is what's in it for me or the with them. So what's in it for me, for me to come and volunteer at this particular service? 
And you need to be able to answer that and tell them what's in it for them. And they need to experience that and know that your actions are actually the equaling your words. So here's a little test for you. I want you all to think about a volunteer that you have in your service. Think about how many tasks they would do for you in a month. So how many actual tasks they would do and come up with that number. Now think about the number of times you recognise that volunteer's efforts in a week. And now think about how much you would do that across the month. Now take the two of those numbers away. So take the number of recognition um, incidents away from the number of tasks they do. And that's how, the gap is how many more times you need to start to recognise them. So every, and if we aim for that, then we're probably giving them enough recognition. Now, when I say recognition, I'm not saying you have to give them chocolates every time they do something, or I'm saying that you have to give them a gift or a prize or a voucher or anything tangible like that. It's an acknowledgement. It's a thank you. It's sitting them down and giving them feedback. Uh, and probably in this instance, I guess there's probably room in there. You're also giving them the debriefs and the catch ups but moving it away from the task itself and going into them personally as a volunteer and how they're feeling about that and making sure that it's an environment where they will actually honestly answer. So I'm, I'm happy to hear, see that somebody has said there that they have that induction evening where they can actually opt out. And a lot of organisations are doing that. It's kind of an introductory induction and then you get a get a clear idea of what, what the goal is and then you can opt out. What you need to be sure is in those induction processes when you say this is the things that we offer or if volunteers are saying that, that they're all going to have that, um, that experience. So let's start to list all the many ways that you recognise and reward your volunteers um, in your service. And while we do that, I'm going to bring up a cheat sheet for you. Um, on ways that we can um, we can recognise volunteers. <clears throat> and this allows this is just this is on Volunteering Australia's website. So these are lots of ways to just say a little thank you to a volunteer. Now, what I need to stress here is something around. Um, I'm going to focus here a little bit on the two on two different two different groups. One is the students, and one is skilled volunteers. So what was found in a lot of discussion and um, talk with students and young volunteers is that the number one reason that they don't volunteer is they don't have time and they don't have, um, they're too busy with their other life to volunteer. So they're not gonna make the time. The reason for this is, is that the number one competition you've got to getting a volunteer at your service is choice. So just like the numbers of pasta sources on a shelf in the shop, these, these volunteers have a multitude of choices of what they can do with their time and how long they can commit to a service. So choice has really declined um, the intake of young volunteers for a lengthy time. They wanna just come in quickly. Information that we've got from skilled volunteers um, is that they really need to feel a connection and they need to feel valued. So a lot of skilled volunteers or professionals that are volunteering in many ways, so I'll put this into the instance of solicitors um, perhaps that you have, is are they connected to the service and are they treated like a professional? So not to be treated like a lackey who was there for manpower and hours, but they need to actually be given feedback um, at a level that they understand. 
And that may be a setting up a standard of a, a process where they are connecting with your uh, one particular person or another senior person who um, talks to them in a way that allows them to grow and and broaden their experiences if that's what they're doing, um, but also talks to them in a way that, that acknowledges that they have a foundation skill and knowledge already, that, that they're not coming in as a student, that they are already a professional. And, and one of the ways you can do that is to actually allow them to give feedback into your volunteer program and actually listen to their feedback and use it and let them see it being used. So do, do you actually ask them for their input into the entire organisation? Because that's quite a rewarding experience for a volunteer. Do you actually um, let them have a say on how they are treated as a volunteer or how the work could be modelled differently? And do you try what, um, do you at least make the effort to put that up and see if it is feasible, some of the stuff they come up with? So it is is really important with skilled volunteers and they are um, you know with the corporates wanting to see that a lot more as well as those that have to do it we are seeing a lot of the complaints come back that are around the way that they are treated more as a, a an everyday volunteer rather than a professional first and foremost okay so um, When I, so it, can you all just um, maybe drop down in that chat box just some ideas of what you do do um, with your volunteers um, as far as giving them a rewarding uh, recognition? I'm assuming there's also uh, aspects there where you're giving testimonials to students because that's normally what they want. And it's more than just saying they've done those hours. It's about saying, here's the projects that they worked on. Um, another thing about the young entrepreneurial volunteer is their desire to also be able to promote what they're doing. So do they get an opportunity to uh, put themselves, put their work out there into their public peer domain, uh, and it is that could be in social media, or it could be um, by way of saying that this project has got their name against it, or, or addressed in their on a website, they're acknowledged and things like that. So that they are actually expecting that they get that acknowledgement, and I would hasten to guess that the professional uh, volunteer is exactly the same as far as the um, acknowledgement of their efforts goes. Um, any comments on that? Oh, great. And so, yeah. And those emails, you know, we, one organisation I worked in, we used to have the, the wall of fame and it was just it was just snippets of words that were said and sometimes the name was cut out. But um, it may seem like something that's tacky to you to do, to put a, a, a bowl of lollies out on a table and a thank you note on it, but it may not be received as tacky from those that are receiving them and it may actually make a real difference to their day. Or, you know, have something in their in on their cup or a note in their computers as they start. Just things like that that start to acknowledge the work that they're about to do, um, and yeah, and celebrate some of those those milestones that they may hit individually or as a volunteer group themselves. All right, so we're going to just move on to retention. Who has a problem retaining volunteers? I often get told uh, that we have retention problems in organisations and my question is to them, what is retention? So retention to me is actually the result of getting your volunteer program set up well within your organisation, the recruitment planned and followed, and the volunteers working in roles that they feel valued and supported in. Retention is just the result of getting all of the other stuff right. 
So if you have everything else looking good, then volunteers will stick around and they'll stick around beyond their committed time. So the next part of that is, is do you ask them when they are interviewed, how long can you commit to? What you need to do is consider that the volunteer is going to have in their mind a set time that they'll give you. Do you ask them that? Because if you ask them and they say, I'll give you three months and they're there for three months, then you don't have a retention issue. You've kept them as long as they said that they would actually stay. Don't be fearful of uh, saying that it's, it, we, don't, we, ha we don't keep them for the term of their natural life, so therefore that they're not a volunteer. So that um, if, a, if a volunteer is saying that they're going to commit to three months and you have a lot of those, then you have to start to set your volunteer program up around episodic volunteers and projects that last for three months. Or do you say, can you commit for the term of the project? And this is roughly how long it may take. And try and commit them to the length of it. And if they're not staying that time, then you need to honestly sit down and ask them why they don't want to be there any longer. And see if there is a way that you can change that. I also want to consider that retention is also um, something that you don't want. So sometimes organisations have a problem where they've got volunteers that they don't want to retain, but they can't get rid of them. Well, you can, as long as you're not breaking any uh, legislative conditions on how you do it or how you treat them, um, you can get rid of volunteers. And it's not a good fit for you or other volunteers if you don't address uh, poor performance and so forth. So if we consider that Statistics are saying that by 2020, the largest group of Australian population is going to be the millennials. We need to consider that this type of person is going to want an experience that they get something out of and then they move on to another choice and they want input, they want it um, to be rewarding and they want to be able to promote it and things like that. So you need to consider how are you, ret are you retaining volunteers that are going to fit your future as well. Um, has anybody got anything to say about the retention of volunteers in your service? Is it good? Are you keeping them? Are you wanting them to stay? Um, or do you have a problem with actually um, some that won't go? This is just a slide that is available to you on your uh, handouts and it starts to give you a bit of a breakdown on some of the generations. The reason I'm putting this in your handouts is so that you can see that there is literally, um, uh, we're in an era where we can have five different generations working in one workplace and they all have different attitudes and needs and you need to keep in mind that you cannot treat them all the same. So when you're giving feedback to an, uh, someone from an older generation, their, their um, expectations and their experience with you is going to be quite different to the younger ones. So you, this, and I mean, this goes across paid employees as well, but with volunteers, um, you have to look at their motivations um, and that, that recognition just that little bit more and you, this is a good way to actually take, keep that in mind. So their loyalty and their views on authority, um, they'll ask why and they want to learn and they want to get more out of it. And they may actually, the younger generations may actually want to know a bigger, fuller picture than um, about what they're involved in, but they may not necessarily um, need to know a whole bunch about the organisation as a whole. But you're, Older generations we tend to find um, do actually care a lot more around the organisational structure and they may actually want to know, have some input into that as well. So we're just going to go through a few final points before I open up to your actual questions and you can guide me on what I go back to in all of that with these questions. But 
some final thoughts around the skill volunteers and the millennial volunteers. Um, how are they welcomed by all of your organisation? And I'm meaning every person there. Do they respect the role that they play? And do they respect the, the added gift that is given by a volunteer that, or an unpaid member of the staff? Are they introduced at the start to the organisation's visions and goals? Are they actually part of it? From the bigger picture, are they feeling like they're part of it? Um, what we are finding in, um, in with young volunteers that are coming into projects especially is that they are wanting to, they're following a cause. So if they really get hooked at the start with what that cause is, then they will embed themselves in the project a little bit more. Your professional volunteers will definitely want you to start to ask them their feedback from the start or their experiences and just allowing them to tell you about their experiences and knowledge. Um, it, it, it's a minefield of progress and ideas and opportunities for you, uh, but someone has to capture those. And that goes right back to, I'm hoping that everyone knows their names or there's a way that they know who that volunteer is beyond the job that they're doing for you. Um, are they recruited professionally? So you will have to put some uh, HR practices around the recruitment. You should actually be inducting them well, giving them all of the information they need, including their rights and responsibilities, and allowing them to know exactly what's expected of them, what the boundaries are, and not feeling like they're just part of a bigger machine and um, do your bit and then you're out the other end. Um, are they recognised in a way that meets their needs? So this is saying cover those bases of little thank yous and hellos by, by all of the staff, tip bits left for them, acknowledgements, the letters, the functions. I, I'm dearly, dearly hoping that every one of you does something on National Volunteer Week and on International Volunteer Day. Uh, and if you want some resources, hook into our website and get them. But also you've got Student Volunteer Week too. These are not only opportunities for you to recruit, but they're also opportunities for you to thank everybody, not only who is currently working for you, but who has. Which goes to my next point, are, are they remembered after their work is done? Do, do they have legacy with your organisation or the opportunity to? Because that's where you may get your next return volunteer when it next comes up. Um, volunteer week is in uh, May and International Volunteer Day is on December the 5th. International Volunteer Coordinator Day is November the 5th, by the way, for all you coordinators. Um, National Volunteer Week is the 21st of May. We also, we here have um, awards for volunteers, so you can nominate them for a statewide award as well. And jump on our website for all of that, or contact me. Are they given projects to work on and are they credited for that projects? Um, and can they show initiative? Are they able to show some initiative and do things differently? If they come up with a suggestion, um, one of the things they don't want to hear is, oh, that's not how we do it here or that can't be done, or we've never done it that way. That's where you need to start to change. And that's where it's behind the door stuff. It's what's happening, how are you set up, and how much are you accommodating the new breed of volunteer um, and the, the way that uh, society is changing, because your program has to move with that. Can they promote the work they do? So um, do they have an opportunity to, to bask in their own glory a little bit? And do they stay engaged after their hours are done? If they're not engaged after their hours are done, if they are recruited for a set of hours, then you need to ask why and you need to ask them that. What motivation did they have coming in and was it met? So a lot of this is about you finding ways to ask them um, what they want to get out of it, listening to them as a valued person and then um, paying attention to what they say. 
So let me ask one last question, and I'm hoping I get a lot of answers to this. What is one action that you will take away from everything we've spoken about today? Just one action, and it can be very small, or it could be I'm going to get Volunteer in Queensland to help me go through the national standards. It's a big ask. <laughs> not, and, and I'll say it's not just uh, Volunteer in Queensland, all of the peak bodies and all of the states actually have capacity to, um, to do a lot of this work. <clears throat> I'm just reading your messages here. So um, Maureen, that's fantastic that um, you have a really good core of those long-term volunteers, uh, but you are obviously taking steps to um, engage with them. The student volunteers um, do need to not get into the frame of mind of they're just using me because I'm free labour. Um, they will think that you have to get down and start to acknowledge when they start to get a really good feeling about something they've done. So uh, they may not pay enough attention to their own reactions to say, how did that make you feel when that client said that? How do you record when a client says something good about one of your volunteers that they can take that away? Because when you're on a roller coaster in a position, you need to actually have something to grab onto when it, it when things drop down a little. Yeah, so if you have a look at the the standards, um, the, the gap thing I showed you isn't actually readily available, but the standard clauses are you can look at to start to just do a bit of a spot check or speak to your peak body um, and they can help you out. Um, yeah, so the social media stuff um, is actually really good and people sort of go, oh no, we're scared of it. Uh, we actually have a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks around how to use social media more than just uh, blogs. <clears throat> but it is, we, I mean, when you look at events, if, if you go out into events or anything in your community, you look and you'll see that those those selfie stations where you can take a photo of yourself you can stage it and say that we don't mind you as long as this is the boundaries of what you can do on social media to promote the work you're doing. Because, I mean, I, if, if I was one of your volunteers, I'd be pretty chuffed to say how much you're helping the world. <clears throat> and it may be a case of um, uh, your service actually doing the outburst and naming them uh, with their permission, of course, or highlighting those. But definitely look at the National Volunteer Week or Vol International Volunteer Day as a time to do it. Okay, so any questions anyone's got? Anything you want me to go back over a little bit or want me to clarify? So I'll just remind everyone uh, while you're thinking up your excellent questions, that there are two ways you can ask questions. You can type them into the question box on the control panel, or you can put your hand up and we can unmute you and um, you can answer, you can ask your question verbally. So Rachel, you've got your hand up. Did you want to ask your question or are you, let me just check in here. Ah, thanks very much. Uh, so Rachel's just said, thank you. Um, she got a lot out of this. Fantastic. Any cool. other questions? Thanks, Rachel. All right. So um, I think that might be all the questions there. I think, um, you know, there was a lot of engagement throughout this presentation, which is really good. So thank you for participating in that, everyone. Um, if you do have any other questions you'd like to ask Michelle, um, she's just put her email address up on the slide there, so training at volunteeringqueensland.org.au, and I would encourage you all to go and have a look at the Volunteering Queensland website. There's a lot of really great information on there, and, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, 
you can help improve what you're doing in your centre. Mm. Um, and also if you're a volunteer, you know, looking, going and talking to your centre, if you've got any suggestions, I think that is an appropriate thing to do to provide them with some help. Um, you know, volunteers in CLCs are just so important and um, so highly regarded. So I think this is mm. um, hopefully giving everyone some really good tips to move forward. And can I also say if you do have um, any of those recognition events and so forth, if you want um, one of your volunteer peak bodies like VQ um, or, or a resource centre, don't be shy in asking them to come along and represent uh, the, the, the broader sector and thank your volunteers. Um, it's nothing for us if we can fit it in to go out and be part of a ceremony like that because that's, that's what they deserve. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for your time today and for sharing your expertise. No problem. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. So our next webinar is next week. I hope you have all registered. Thank you. See you later. Bye.